and we'll continue. So today our topic um, is wellness, uh, wellness and your brain in VUCA times. Um, VUCA stands for vol uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So stress can sometimes come from all sides at once and looks different to, to everyone from transitioning to a new job or a new country to workplace pressure or home life demands. But what we can do to support ourselves, sorry, what can we do to support ourselves when this pressure is on and the cortisol starts to rise? Um, in this engaging presentation, we will find out more about brain optimization and how to use the latest in neuroscience for peak and mental wellness every day. Fascinating insights are combined with simple and actionable tips and tricks to keep you feeling at your best, even in these VUCA times. Um, today, our speaker is Alison Forrest. Um, Alison is a certified executive leadership coach and partners with emerging leaders to help them go from good to great. Uh, she combines the power of deep transformational coaching with science-based knowledge to allow our clients to consciously drive sustainable change, change within their own lives. Um, Alison spent 17 years in funds management and investment banking, working across three continents and in two different languages. Um, following years of board positions and managing people and teams, Alison is now the founder of Moxie Boss Coaching and Consulting. And delights in partnering with emerging leaders to help them become the managers they wish they had. So on behalf of the NSC Glasgow, um, Alison, we will welcome you to this presentation and you can go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that lovely welcome and thank you for inviting me today. Um, I am excited to be here. It's fun spending more time amongst engineers <laughs> in, in my investment banking role uh, years ago now, it seems like. Um, I used to be CFO of a number of offshore wind parks around Europe. So um, that had a lot to do with engineers and construction engineers and electrical engineers. Um, so they're a very special kind of people. So it's nice to be back amongst um, you all again. And it's also really good to be amongst people who have experienced some shift in where they're actually living in the world. So I understand many of you have actually moved overseas to live and work. And I, I really do commend you on that because that, that adds an extra layer of complexity um, to your work and your lifestyle as well. So um, I really do applaud um, your, your bravery in moving overseas because I know it's not easy. I've done it a number of times myself. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to be amongst like-minded people again. Thank so today, <laughs> today I thought um, it would be really good to sort of focus on how we can optimize our brain. So I'm a leadership coach and a lot of the time I talk with my clients about um, sort of self-leadership, things like confidence and emotional intelligence. But a, a lot of the time people forget about physically optimizing your brain as well. Um, because a lot of what we need to do on a daily basis to keep our stress levels down and our resilience up is actually physically looking after our brain and optimizing the way our brain works so that we can survive and thrive in these VUCA times. So as we said, VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous times. And so this talk gives you all kinds of tips and tricks and really actionable pieces that you can take away and start implementing today um, to make you feel better and more focused and more engaged in your work and in your life generally. So this will also add to general life satisfaction. So without further ado, I will just share my screen so we can all get into some slides. Um, okay. Right, so wellness and your brain in VUCA times. This is all about you versus you. So what is your personal success formula? We all have different things that we do or, you know, we, we eat different things or we, we drink different things that make us feel on top of our game 
or make us feel tired and sluggish. And this affects our performance every day. So really, it comes down to what you need to handle your stress and your, your mental capacity at any time. So when you think about it, when are you really at your best? What do you need to be at your best or more often at your best? What would be possible if you were more commonly at your best? Just think about what you might be capable of if you were more commonly at your best. And how would your life be different? What, what would happen differently? It's kind of fun to imagine where you could be um, if you really focused on optimizing your brain and your well-being in general. So today we're talking a little bit about neuroscience. So I am a leadership coach and an ex-investment banker and things. Um, but when I was studying coaching and when I was actually being coached, I noticed that my brain was somehow changing as well. And I thought that was really interesting because I could feel my thoughts and my thought patterns changing from what I was doing before. Um, so I was just wondering, what is it that this coaching is doing to my head? And I'm thinking differently. So I actually looked up a course um, at MIT Sloan and I did a certification in neuroscience for business. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is actually based on this course from MIT Sloan. Um, and it's, it's science, but it, it's really basic and it's super easy. And um, yeah, it, it's very actionable what we're going to be talking about today. So really, the brain is an incredibly busy organ in the body. So we have around about 86 billion neurons in our brain or brain cells. And in any moment, they're, they're looking at what's going on inside your body, how you're feeling, if you're cold or hungry, what your thoughts are doing, you know, what your emotions are doing. And your brain is also looking for messages outside in the world as well. So if there's any dangers going on, you know, if there's anybody that needs you, you know, what's what's happening in the world around you. And the brain processes all of those messages and then makes assumptions and draws connections between each of those pieces of information, every millisecond, billions, billions of pieces of information. So when our brain is not working optimally, it's really difficult for us to do this in any, in any solid way. Um, so that can lead to things like um, lack of focus and brain fog and um, lack of motivation. So I've, got a, I've got an echo somewhere. <laughs> Um, so we really do need to focus on our brain, particularly because some of the main things that help us in our day-to-day -day lives, particularly in managing stress, are what happens right here, just behind your forehead, in your prefrontal cortex. This is where all your executive functions take place, so all of your higher cognitive functions. And these are really important when you're at work, you know, when you move countries, when you're talking to someone in a different language, all of these different things are incredibly important for day-to-day -day functioning in our VUCA society. So executive functions are things like regulating your emotions or having emotional intelligence, switching between tasks, solving complex problems, overriding unconscious biases, thinking flexibly and creatively, really important in these VUCA times, attention and focus, decision-making and learning and remembering. So your prefrontal cortex does a lot. So we need to make sure that this part specifically um, is really optimized on a daily basis so that we can forge ahead um, and reach our potential that we really want to reach. And when we really focus on optimizing this part of our brain, this will also naturally bring down our stress levels and increase our resilience as well. So this, this helps sort of save us from burnout because that's not a nice experience. And these VUCA times have certainly been leading people into burnout or burnout-like symptoms. So we certainly want to avoid that. So hopefully today you'll get some tips and tricks so that you can really decrease your stress and increase your resilience and help that prefrontal cortex do its job properly. So the first tip, I've got five tips for you. And the first one, it seems easy and it seems logical, but there might be some interesting um, history behind it or some interesting science behind it. So my first tip to you, my friends, is sleep. So 98 to 99% of the population requires seven to nine hours of sleep. 
Um, I think Donald Trump says he only needs four hours a night, but maybe he's one of the one percent. Who knows? But generally, we do need seven to nine hours of sleep every night. And that's good quality sleep and a decent amount of REM sleep and deep sleep as well. So if you need to have a weekend lion, or maybe if you're working from home and you find yourself taking a few lunchtime naps, <laughs> that might imply that you're not quite getting enough sleep every night. So that's a good indicator that perhaps you need to focus more on your sleep patterns. And why do we need seven to nine hours of sleep? Why is this so important? Well, this is the interesting bit and not too many people know about this. I thought this was quite fascinating. So the glymphatic system requires seven to nine hours of uh, sleep so it can do its job each night to eliminate toxins in your brain. And these toxins build up over each day from things like um, too little sleep from the night before, <laughs> alcohol, stress, and poor food choices. And so your body needs seven to nine hours to start flushing out those toxins each night because these toxins are actually the same toxins that are found in the brains of people with neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So it really is a really important uh, system that is not so often talked about in the body. And one way you can support it, apart from the sleep, is actually sleeping on your side um, at nighttime. Instead of sleeping on your back or your front, actually sleeping on your side helps that detoxification process at nighttime. So that is kind of an easy tip that I can give you um, just to help your body sort of flush out what it needs to each night. And I'm sorry, but one of the things that um, also really doesn't help sleep at night is alcohol, particularly if alcohol is very close to your bedtime. So if you have a few glasses of wine with your dinner and then go straight to sleep afterwards, it really does put a lot of pressure on your body. So it puts the glymphatic system through more work than it would usually. But it also has a really um, significant effect on your heart as well. So your heart rate increases and your heart rate variance decreases, which is not a great combination. And your liver has to work more and your kidneys need to work more. So it puts your body under a lot of stress that it doesn't need. Your body should be resting at night and restoring itself instead of being under stress as you sleep. And your quality of sleep will obviously be really, really affected. So a really good way of looking at what's happening in your sleep and any sort of patterns is buying one of these trackers, like a Fitbit or like this, this is an aura ring um, that I've got. So it shows me, you know, everything from body temperature during the night, um, if it was elevated, if my heart rate was elevated, how my heart rate variability was, you know, how much REM and deep sleep I was getting. So I can really track what helps my sleep and what hinders my sleep. So I know alcohol definitely hinders my sleep and maybe having a bath before bedtime that sort of helps my sleep during the night. So knowing what your success formula is, in this case, is really, really important. And of course, you know, sleep affects our prefrontal cortex, our, our executive functions. So it affects our decision making, reactions and our memory recall. Really interestingly, there was a, a study in um, oh, the Middle East somewhere, and they actually found that judges they made um, worse decisions, less favorable decisions. They made um, biased and sexist decisions and racist decisions in court when they were closer to their lunch break. So being hungry is, is really a thing. And being, um, being tired is, is definitely, it, it affects your system as well. So, you know, sleep and being hungry at the same time um, can really affect all of your focus and your decision making and your reactions at the same time. So definitely, definitely watch out for that. So helpful tips um, on sleep, aim for seven to nine hours of sleep, obviously. Sleep on your side. Um, as I said, for the glymphatic system, the neurotoxins, avoid your alcohol and coffee shortly before bed. Limit your blue lights and phones as well before you go to bed. And maybe a nighttime sleep meditation. Um, I personally love nighttime sleep meditations, just a quick one before I go to bed, 
or even if you wake up in the middle of the night, um, if you experience some insomnia, say from worry or anxiety around three o'clock, I know that's extremely common. I used to get that a lot. Um, a nighttime meditation can definitely help with that type of anxiety because it brings you to this moment now. Instead of thinking about the past or the future, it brings you to what's happening in this moment now. And in this moment now, you know, there's nothing to actually be scared of. You are just in bed and that's it. So a nighttime meditation can really help with your sleep patterns. So next up on the list, we have hydration. So in your success formula, hopefully this should be an easy one. Um, it used to be actually tricky for me. I did not used to drink much water at all. Um, before I started learning about the importance of hydration, I wasn't interested in water. It just didn't thrill me. Um, I just don't like the taste of water. So I just didn't drink it much at all. Um, but it is, it has been shown that, you know, your brain is 78% water. So hydration is incredibly important to your brain. Even being dehydrated by one to 3% will impact your memory, focus, and concentration. If you're thirsty, you are already dehydrated. So your focus, concentration, and memory are already being impacted. And these, these like your memory and focus, they're the first things to go because previously, sort of in our primal days, our brain thought that, you know, these functions were not particularly important. You know, they weren't really important for our survival. But... You know, today in the workplace, particularly in these VUCA times, you know, you need to be focused. You need to be able to concentrate. Um, you need your memory and everything to, to concentrate on what you're doing. Um, so hydration is something really simple, but really, really effective. And they showed in another study that um, if you're driving a car dehydrated, your reactions are just as poor as if you were driving drunk at 0.08% alcohol, which is over the legal driving limit in Australia. And I think that's a legal driving limit in, in the UK as well. So it is surprising what an impact being dehydrated can have on, on your capability to function properly. So I kind of see hydration as an easy win for your success formula for your brain optimization. So how can we do this the easiest way? So for somebody like me who just didn't used to like water at all, wasn't interested, <laughs> try making it interesting. You know, you can add lemon or cucumber or something like that. Um, bubbles, mineral water, that's very big in Germany. And I think someone here is from Holland as well. So maybe it is over there as well. Um, you can add granulated vitamins. You know, I, I like adding... Uh, orange flavored magnesium to my water in the morning. Um, that gives me a nice kickstart and it tastes good. And there's also different types of multivitamins that I can add to my water over the day. Um, so I can ensure that I'm getting a few extra vitamins and I also drink my water. Um, you can buy a nice desk jug or a cute water bottle, whatever works for you, whatever makes it a little bit more attractive to you. <laughs> I've, I've got my liter bottle here. So this has um, some sort of multivitamin in there. And um, this is my third one for today because I actually, I did some sport this morning. So um, I've had an, an extra liter. Um, but, you know, I carry that around with me everywhere. It goes with me everywhere. If I go to the shops, it comes with me. You know, if I go to any meetings, at least another water bottle comes with me. It's just a habit that you need to create. You know, if you're in the office, fill up a water bottle between meetings or take a glass with you. Just make it become a really easy habit that you don't even have to think about. I mean, it could be herbal tea in the afternoon um, that does it for you. You know, that, that also counts as um, hydration, as does a lot of uh, water-rich foods like cucumber and watermelon and things like that. So that all counts for your hydration. And studies have shown that you need about half a litre of water for every 15 kilos of body weight. So half a litre for 15 kilos of body weight. So most people are going to be between about two to three, three and a half litres each day. Um, but, you know, a lot of water comes from the food that we eat. So maybe chop off half a litre to a litre um, and then you should be good to go. But, you know, if you if you feel thirsty, you are already dehydrated, unfortunately, my friends. <laughs> 
All right, now the third one. This this is kind of my favorite. It's not everybody's favorite though. So let's let's just go through this and see what we can find. The third one is oxygenate. So when we're under stress, we shallow breathe. That is just what the body does because it, it's accessing the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight response. And this elevates our cortisol, elevates our stress in our body. So when we shallow breathe, our body automatically thinks that we're under stress. So it increases the cortisol. And when we have too much cortisol and adrenaline in our body, particularly for an extended period of time, that actually breaks down our cells. So it is destructive to our body. And that's not what we want. That's not what we want brain cells doing or any other cells in our body. So making sure that you're breathing deeply um, can go a long way to helping your brain oxy oxygenate and um, focus on uh, functioning optimally. So focusing on breathing, some sort of meditative breathing exercises to really trigger your parasympathetic nervous system. So the opposite of your fight or flight. Um, you can practice breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth a little bit more slowly. Or just slow down your breathing generally by box breathing. So like four seconds in, hold for four seconds, four seconds out, hold for four seconds and repeat. And it's hard to be agitated when you're kind of focused on holding your breath and regulating your breath like that. So that, that can calm you down really, really quickly. And, you know, we all want to be lowering our stress levels. So that's a super easy win and an easy way of doing it. It doesn't take very long at all. So that's an easy way to oxygenate. <laughs> the, the most obvious way is to actually get some exercise. So any sort of exercise is good. Any sort of movement is really good. So even if it's just standing up at your desk or getting one of those standing desks, so you're not sitting all day at your desk, um, walking around, trying to do 200 every hour, um, you know, making sure that you maybe take a little walk at lunchtime, getting outside, all of that will help you and help oxygenate your system and your brain, which is what you need to be able to lower your stress levels. So they do recommend um, five to 10,000 steps a day. Um, you know, in winter, that can be difficult. So I, I would encourage moving around as much as possible. The best thing you can do, though, is to actually do aerobic activity. Now, I know everybody should be doing it, but not many people are doing it regularly. <laughs> but they do say about 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. So about two and a half hours of aerobic exercise a week, just getting on some sort of a sweat. Um, so that's, that's um, difficult for some people, but once you get into it, you might really enjoy it, I have to say. <laughs> And the trick is with this aerobic exercise, you should actually enjoy it as much as you can. Because if you don't enjoy it, your cortisol and your stress hormones will actually increase. So if you're forcing yourself to do something that you don't like, um, that will kind of negate the, the good impact that sport will have on your brain. So it'll, it'll sport will have you know, a good impact on other parts of your body, your know, heart and lungs and things like that but it won't have such a beneficial impact on your brain, which I thought was really interesting <laughs> when I read this fact. And uh, that, that makes it a little bit tricky. So you need to like it as well as do it. My goodness. <laughs> and so why is this the case? And so this is kind of the, the interesting neuroscientific thing. So whenever we learn something new or have a new experience, like um, moving to a new country or learning a new language or starting a new job and having to learn some new skills, <laughs> Somebody's gone off mute. learning new skills, anything that we need to learn that's new to us, we actually need to create new brain cells. And, you know, we can do that as adults. So neuroplasticity is most definitely possible for adults. It just takes a little bit longer than it does for children. So you can teach an old dog new tricks, as the saying goes. And, you know, the more we practice something new, the more we do something new, we can grow those brain cells. But the best way and the fastest way to grow these brain cells is by releasing this um, protein in the brain called BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this 
increases the neurogenesis, so the creation of brain cells, 30% faster than not doing any sort of exercise. So in VUCA times, when you know new information, new ways of working are coming at us constantly, doing this kind of exercise, aerobic activity, will actually really help us on a day-to-day -day basis. And particularly HIT training, so HIIT, high intensity interval training, um, studies have shown that doing HIT session, that BDNF will immediately go to your um, prefrontal cortex and immediately help your executive functions. So if you have a meeting later on that day or you need to really get focused on something, laser focus on something that afternoon, doing some sort of uh, stressful exercise in the morning, this HIIT training in the morning will actually help you later on in the day. I think, Alison, you've gone on mute, if you could, yeah. I didn't touch anything, I promise. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Someone put me on mute. Um, yeah, so, um, so the best way of um, doing, uh, getting more BDNF into the brain and getting more focus is actually doing this HIIT training. So I, I'm sorry if I'm the bearer of bad news, if you're not into aerobic training, but you know, to optimize your brain function, it is most definitely something that helps you to focus on that. All right. So the key things for oxygenation, when you try any sort of sport, find something that you do enjoy. <laughs> um, hit is better than endurance. But any kind of exercise is good. So, you know, rather than sitting down at your desk all day, walk around a little bit, take your dog for a walk, um, go out into the sunshine or at least the outdoors at lunchtime for even if it's 15 minutes. You know, they say take the stairs, all those little tips and tricks um, to get moving and get oxygen moving around your body and more into your brain. And they've also found that having a community and socializing at the same time as doing sport really helps because it releases a bonding hormone called oxytocin and that makes you happier and more engaged um, because we are social beings um, so that can definitely help um, you know if you want to engage more in the sporting activities and make it more part of your life I know that that definitely helped me. I, I didn't used to be a sporting kind of a person at all. It took me 30 years <laughs> before I went to a gym. <laughs> and I actually stayed. I was completely shocked. I used to hate exercise, but I, I found my people. I found um, a gym close to where I worked, so it was very convenient. And I went at the same time every day, and there was a bunch of girls who went at the same time every day, and so we knew each other, we'd look out for each other, we'd talk to each other. And, you know, that was exactly what I needed. So I was getting oxytocin, I was getting BDNF, I was getting, I was getting all these good things. And then I moved to Germany and I didn't have that anymore. I couldn't find a gym with that kind of feeling, with those kinds of people, with that kind of timetable. And it took me eight years of trying to do exercise again to find something that I enjoyed. And now... I have one of those um, exercise bikes, those at-home exercise bikes with the big screen where you can do live rides with thousands of other people and give them high fives on the screen and all that kind of stuff. And that is, that is my community now. You know, I see them on the leaderboard. We meet in real life. Uh, we have Facebook groups and things. So that's kind of like an accountability, that's friendship, that's community. And that definitely helps um, with you know, keeping me focused on doing that type of exercise. So you know, that's, that's a little, little trick for, for getting you going in oxygenation because it really is one of the most important aspects um, when we're living in VUCA times, um, the oxygenation to, to really help our brain learn new things quickly. Um, so that's, that's a little tip for you there. <laughs> now, the fourth one is fueling. Um, obviously this is food. So this is nutrition, this is food. Our brain is only about 2% of our entire body weight, but it uses 25 to 30% of the fuel that we consume. So of the energy that our body consumes, it uses almost a third or a quarter to a third of what we actually consume. So it is, it is really hungry for this energy. 
and it can't store energy either. So we need to make sure that it's quality fuel and it can use it all the time because particularly when we're stressed or focused, that's when it uses up more energy than usual. So the quality of our food is actually really, really important. So it's a bad idea to be hungry <laughs> at any time of the day. If you're looking for focus then um, and good decision-making, um, that will really suffer if you are hungry. You know, I, I know I definitely experienced this. Um, it's, it's, it's not pretty to be around me when I'm hungry. So um, something definitely to keep in mind if you think you're too busy to eat lunch at work, make sure you do have a snack or something with you. So otherwise, you know, you will be getting brain fog. If your brain has nothing to feed it, no energy to feed it, then, you know, it can't explore these high cognitive functions that it needs to do in um, stressful and difficult times. So the brain's limbic system, which em embeds our habits and behavioral patterns, is connected to our gut, our stomach, and the vagus nerve and neurons in the brain and the gut. So th there's sort of like a, a three-way connection, basically, between our gut microbiome, our stomach, and our gut neurons and our brain neurons. There's kind of a, a three-way connection between all of them. And our gut microbiome can communicate with our brain by releasing particular chemicals through the blood. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting connection. Like we, we know more about space than we do the gut microbiome. But, you know, they have shown that there is a distinctive connection between the two and an imbalanced gut microbiome. It affects the amygdala in the brain, um, which controls fear and anxiety which can lead to increased stress and increased cortisol, as well as depression and um, other, other difficulties like that in your life. So it really is quite important to pay attention to how you're feeding your stomach um, and what, what kind of, what's the quality of the food that you're giving it. So proteins and whole grains, good fats like avocado and salmon and vegetables are all important parts of a, of a good quality and nutritious diet. Dark foods like berries and dark chocolate yeah, and beans, they help build these cells into full new neurons like we were talking about before in sport. So this aids the process of learning something new. So just like BDNF. And probiotics help build this BDNF as well. And also your immunity. And it also improves low moods. So probiotics are considered now increasingly to be really necessary as part of a healthy diet. And we can get that in um, tablets at your local pharmacy or boots in the UK, something like that. Um, you can also get it naturally, like in kimchi and sauerkraut and um, natural yogurt and things like that. So there's not a lot of science backing up probiotics, but there is some science. So, you know, maybe this is part of your success formula, experimenting to see what makes you feel good and, and what can optimize your moods and your focus during the day in terms of the food and the nutrition that you're getting. Okay, and the last one is simplify, simplification. Now, the first step of this is choice reduction. So we might have seen things like um, Steve Jobs, for instance, had his uh, work wardrobe. Um, you can have a morning routine. Um, you know, you can have a, a food diet that you, you know, the same breakfast each day or the same lunch each day or pre-prepare your food on Sundays, whatever it is that keeps your brain just unitasking, you know, it doesn't have to think about too much extra because as I said before, you know, your, your brain is just inundated with information and stress. In these VUCA times, there's new information and, and stresses coming at it all of the time. So whatever we can do to support our brain and say, hey, you don't have to worry about this. You've got these decisions to make. You've got that to do, but you don't need to worry about this decision at the moment. So anything we can do to reduce the choices that we need to make in our life is really, really beneficial. And I was, I was watching a, a YouTube video just the other day on multitasking versus unitasking. And there was a really interesting um, example of multitasking versus unitasking. And so I'll, I'll give this to you. You might like it. All the engineers out there, all the left brain thinkers out there might really quite enjoy this. So I'm going to put 
some numbers down the left hand side of this slide and if the number is in red you add seven and if the number is in blue you subtract seven and I'll give you 10 seconds and just in your head um, you know just do it so in 10 seconds just see how far you get okay all right Okay, stop. Now, on the right-hand side of this slide, I'm going to put the same numbers and you do the same thing. So if the number is in red, you add seven. And if the number is in blue, you subtract seven. All right. And stop. Okay. Hopefully you noticed a massive difference. <laughs> What's going on in the left is basically unitasking. It's a lot more simple. It's just red, 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 minus seven, minus seven, minus seven, blah, 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 subtract seven. So that, that's like unitasking. What we're doing on the right-hand side is really like multitasking. So going, thinking this way, thinking that way, thinking this way, thinking that way. So on the right-hand side, when we multitask, we usually make about 30% more mistakes than if we're just unitasking. So it's really been shown that multitasking is not a thing. <laughs> Your brain is literally just switching back and forth between two things that you're trying to do at the same time. So some people appear to be better at multitasking, but humans are just not very good at multitasking at all. So if you're sitting in a meeting and you think you're listening to the person who's presenting, but you're actually playing with your phone and reading emails at the same time, you're not doing both things at once. And your brain does not need this extra pressure on it to try to flick between the two different activities. It's already got enough on its plate. At, at, you know, this, in these VUCA times, it's got enough on its plate. So if there's one thing you can do to simplify your life is to, you know, honestly, just try to unitask whenever things come up. Okay, and the next one, it's one of my favorite things to do, is focusing on mindfulness. And this might be, you know, meditation or um, some sort of breathing or visualization, but it's really just, it's focusing on doing one thing at a time without you know, um, making any deal out of it without judging it, without analyzing it in any way. It's literally just saying, okay, I'm going to just focus on my feet walking on the grass. I'm going to focus on the birds in the sky. I'm not, I'm not thinking about them or judging them in any way. I'm just being right here in the moment and I'm kind of letting my brain relax. And this is what mindfulness is. And it really helps the brain simplify everything and um, relax the stress levels. So emotional intelligence, you know, mindfulness is really about awareness. And when, when we're under stress, we, we really, like the cortisol starts to rise and we get blinkers. So we, we react to situations instead of responding to situations. You know, we, we can't look at things methodically. We just sort of react and we, we say, okay, um, it's got something to do with my past. So uh, that's scary. It's got something to do with the future and I'm extrapolating all of these horrifying circumstances. We're not actually focused on the now, on the issue at hand and responding instead of reacting. And that is exactly what emotional intelligence is. Being able to be aware of what's going on now instead of being influenced by stress of the past or of the past and the future um, and just being focused and mindful of what's happening now and if you can regulate this then it really helps with decision making you know you're not influenced by all of these fears and distractions you can make a decision on the current information um, and, and respond to situations instead of reacting so as I said, stress impacts our ability to respond appropriately or access our focus and attention. And focus and attention are obviously two of our critical abilities that are um, managed by our prefrontal cortex. So how do we simplify in our life? Um, mindfulness practices, as I said, like meditation and breath awareness, some sort of visualization. 
Um, you know, there's uh, different um, body scans that you can do as well. There's all kinds of apps out there that you can use um, to help with meditation and mindfulness. And you can just pick one that works for you. You know, they're very personal things. Um, some people say, oh, I'm just not very good at, at meditation. You know, I've got monkey mind and I can't do it. I can't blank my brain. And that's actually not what meditation is about. So the, the average human being daydreams or is distracted for about 50% of our entire day. So you, can't, you are not ever expected to have a blank brain uh, when you're meditating. You're supposed to try to focus on what's happening in the moment. And if you have thoughts about the past or the future, that's okay. That's normal. Just try to not judge them, not extrapolate on them. Just bring them back in and just focus again on your breath or whatever it was that you were focused on in that moment. So there's no wrong if you're, if you're trying to meditate. And they have shown that 12 minutes a day or most days of the week is actually the optimal time um, to build up resilience. Because there, there was a really interesting study uh, that came out of America and they, they took um, a, a bunch of guys from the US Marines just before they went over to Iraq. And they took their stress levels and their sleeping patterns and things like that. Um, they tested them all out. And then they taught them how to meditate, um, do some breath work for 12 minutes a day before they went over to Iraq. And they asked them to do it as well when they were over in Iraq. And most of them were doing it beforehand and also in Iraq. But before they left, you know, there was a there was a core bunch of them, bunch of the guys who said, I'm not meditating. That's ridiculous. No, not doing that. That's that's for girls or <laughs> whatever. And so they all went over to Iraq. And by the time they came back, everybody's stress level was actually lower than when they went to Iraq and they weren't getting PTSD or anything. And this was because the guys who weren't meditating when they went over there they saw that the other guys who were meditating, they were sleeping soundly every night. They weren't getting the jitters. They weren't getting shell shock under these stressful situations when they're over there. So they said, oh, gosh, I better try that as well. So they also started the meditation practices for 12 minutes a day when they were over there. And so they all actually came back from Iraq and, you know, their stress levels were lower than before they left. So it really showed, I mean, it's, it's, one, it's one study, but it's really interesting, shows that, you know, you can start these kinds of practices before you're stressed in preparation for difficult times, but you can also start when you're under pressure and that will still help lower your stress levels and build up your resilience as well. So I, th I think that's kind of a that's, a, that's a fascinating look at what meditation and mindfulness could do for you. So if you're not doing it already, you know, I would, I would kind of, I'm biased a little bit because I do love it, um, but, you know, try uh, different techniques of meditation and different times of the day and see if you can build a habit out of it. Um, it's, it's an interesting, interesting concept that might be really helpful, particularly for your stress levels. And obviously, it also helps oxygenation as well, which is also really, really important for your prefrontal cortex. So in summary, to help your mind and body perform at their peak. And again, we have sleep. So our seven to nine hours of sleep every night um, to help with the toxins, processing the toxins um, and sleep deprivation affects memory, decision making and our reactions. So I don't know about you, but if I don't get enough sleep, I feel delirious the next day and I, I can't focus on anything. I can't make any sort of decisions. So sleep has a real impact on people. Hydrate, that could be an easy win for your success factors. Um, you know, half a litre for each 15 kilos of body weight, that's about 30 pounds of body weight. Um, you know, add something to the water to make it you know, a, a spiced up a little bit and a little bit more interesting. Um, it's very much low hanging fruit in terms of brain optimization. So it's a great place to start. If you're not doing any of this, <laughs> I, I'd say that's probably a, a great place to start. And it does help with your memory and your concentration, obviously, as well. Oxygenation, aerobic activities, you know, even just moving and walking around, that's going to 
oxygenate your body and your brain. So any kind of activity is going to be beneficial to your brain. Fueling nutritious foods to fuel the brain, um, as well as probiotics to support your gut microbiome. Um, this really helps supporting your positive moods as um, well as your learning um, by producing this BDNF, this protein in the brain. And simplify things. You know, try to do 12 minutes of some sort of mindfulness or meditation most days to try to bring down those stress levels and elevate, elevate those um, resilience levels. So those are the key factors. Now, I guess I would really love to know what your success formula could be. After having listened to all of this, you know, building new habits can be tricky. Um, you know, we if we're if we're at home all day watching Netflix on the couch, um, it's difficult to become a marathon runner. Um, but we can take small steps by changing habits and you know pick the low hanging fruit pick the easy wins because when we do start doing something and we we can achieve it then we get a little boost of testosterone in our brain and our brain says oh that's not so scary okay i want to run a marathon but buying a pair of trainers that's my first step and it wasn't so scary i feel good okay little boost of testosterone and then your brain is willing to take that next step take that little extra risk to get closer to your goal of running the marathon. So the next step might be buying a pair of running shorts and your brain says, okay, I can do this. Next step might be going for a walk around the block and make that a habit. And slowly and surely, you know, you will build up these habits. You will become closer and closer to being the type of person who runs marathons. You know, your, your who will change over time until you become the type of person to run a marathon. So just those little, those little tiny, those little tiny forward action um, is really, really important. So having a little win, like you know, drinking a few liters of water every day, or tracking your sleep, starting to track your sleep, all of these things are getting you closer to optimizing your brain and making sure you have more good days than average days, and more average days than bad days. <laughs> Okay, I will leave it at that. I'll stop sharing and jump back in. So are, are there any questions? <laughs> um, thank you so much, Alison. That's yeah, you're welcome. I know that was a lot of information, hey? <laughs> yes, there's... Um, I'm, I'm curious, if, if anyone has, it, has any tips and tricks that they, they like, um, to share with us to, you know, how do you make yourself drink more water or how do you enjoy exercise? What are some things that people can share so um, other people can get some motivation as well and some ideas? Yeah, um, I will hand over to Engineer Monday now who would probably take comments from everybody mm -hmm. and, and questions if there are, and then you could probably provide some answers to them. So Engineer Monday, please. Yeah. Go ahead. And thank you, Engineer Shego. Um, thank you, Alison. That was quite insightful. <laughs> thank you very much. Very so awesome. now, now we are in the question and answer uh, session. So people should feel free to, you know, raise their hands if you have um, a question, or also you can use the chat room. Mm -hmm. um, but before I proceed, basically, as engineers, you know, multitasking is one one one. <laughs> one factor that is in our DNA. So that one really caught me, you know. <laughs> because, I love it as well. <laughs> because as, as, as engineers, we always think, especially the, the example you gave, I think is very common with most of us. You're in a meeting, you're, you're checking your emails, especially with the virtual meetings these days. You're checking your emails, you're check, looking at your phone, you're still also trying to concentrate in the meeting. So in this time of VUGA, I think the lessons learned is try not to overstress the brain. It has enough on its table. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so the, the floor is open now for questions. Um, there is a question from the chat room um, from Femi Yusuf. And the question is about sleep. What is the best time to go to bed? Seven to eight hours of sleep. What is the best time to go to bed in order to get seven to eight hours of sleep? That's the question. Mm, yeah, interesting question. Um, 
the most important thing is to get the seven to nine hours of sleep. So a lot of people just work backwards. So if you need to get up at 7 a.m. to go to work on time, then kind of work backwards to what time you need to go to bed. And often I, I like to add an extra hour just in case I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep. So it's it's mostly dependent on what works for the people. But I have also read that um, you get the best quality of sleep before midnight. So, you know, if you can go to bed a little bit earlier, so like nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or something, you know, the first couple of hours before midnight and just after midnight are the best quality of sleep I read. So I thought that that was really interesting. So we get the deepest, get the deepest sleep at that time. So maybe, maybe that's a little, little trick. <laughs> okay. I see engineer Shegu, your hands is raised. So go ahead with your own question. Thank you. Yeah, Alison, I've got two questions. Um, the first one, you mentioned about the effect of um, taking alcohol just before sleep. Um, does eating just before sleep, also maybe your dinner close to your sleep time, does it have a similar effect on your sleep? And if yes, is there kind of recommended time you can give between your dinner and your sleep time? So that's my first question. The second mm -hmm. one is about um, um, hydration. You talked about obviously carrying your, having a bottle as one of the tips to mm -hmm. take water a lot of time. Um, a lot of us do coffee in the morning. <laughs> so how does that affect, uh, affect our, our hydration level? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So first one, having, having dinner close to bedtime, it, it's not ideal. Um, it, it doesn't have the same sort of effect as alcohol. So alcohol really affects your heart rate quite um, quite a lot. So with my with my aura ring, I can I can just see um, that I'm my readiness score for the next day is really through the floor because my heart rate has been elevated all night just from a small amount of alcohol. And my heart rate variance has really dipped, should be should be sort of going up. Um, so alcohol really puts a lot of stress on a lot of different organs. So it's it's not just um, not just your liver and kidneys and things like that. It can also affect the way your stomach operates as well, your stomach lining, um, your, your heart rate. Um, so alcohol is the biggest factor in terms of drinking and eating. Um, but, you know, having a big meal before you go to bed, that can also affect your body because, you know, your body has to digest quite a lot when it's trying to make itself comfortable again if you have a very big meal. So when you're sleeping, you should be trying to help your body relax and regenerate. So it shouldn't have to be working over time on different things that it should be doing when you're awake. Um, so I, I, I've heard it's a couple of hours before you go to bed, you should have dinner. So not just before you go to bed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely alcohol is the biggest factor in, in terms of quality of um, sleep and impact on your brain yeah and the second one coffee <laughs> um, everybody likes coffee you know like we, we it makes us happy it's all right <laughs> just don't be using coffee as like a crutch basically so if you're tired don't try to use coffee to hold up your system and think you'll be fine um, so by all means have coffee, but it doesn't really count as hydration because coffee is considered a diuretic. So that actually takes water out of your body. Um, so unfortunately, um, herbal tea is better and water. Um, soft drinks also not ideal. <laughs> Anything as close as possible to water um, without added nasties and sugars and things um, is always gonna be the best. <laughs> Thank, thank you. I think I will take the next two together. One is uh, more or less a uh, experience shared by Olaire Klon, and the second is a question from Alison. The first one, the, the lesson from um, Olaire Klon, he said, a while back, I discovered I had high, high blood pressure while on a routine health checkup. What I have been doing now is to exercise every working day, first thing in the morning, I must say I feel a lot better and I look a lot better as well. So he's now advising uh, as we grow older, it's very important to consider exercise. That is one. Then the next one is a question from Ali, uh, Alfred. 
Hi, first he he he, he thanks you for 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 the good presentation. So you said um, you talked about probiotics and gut microbiome. What does probiotics mean, and what are the new trends that enhances mm -hmm. its function and gut microbiome? Beyond me. That's that's yeah. Alison's question. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you take these two questions together. So the okay, so so you the, can go ahead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, the, the probiotics one. I, I'm not. Um, I'm not a chemist or anything like that. So I don't. I don't know the full details about um, exactly what probiotics do um, to the system. So I, I don't want to give any sort of um, medical advice or anything like that. So I'm. I'm very cautious about that. But. Um, yeah, it's it's something maybe look into it yourself and see if that's something that um, could be interesting for your to help with your gut and, and the way it um, processes the different foods and the chemicals it gives out to your brain and into your blood. So I, I would suggest, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm a leadership coach and I love neuroscience, but <laughs> I, I know just enough to be dangerous. So I, I'll leave that one to the experts. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, I take the last question of the day because um, we, our time has been far spent. Um, this is coming from uh, Anthony again. He said, I am used to waking up by 3 a.m. I hardly get back to sleep. Please advise. Mm. So, so I think this is some, he needs some advice on this. I know, like you said, you're not a doctor, but you know, if you have some mm. tips basically for him, that yeah. would be good. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to get this all of the time as well. I um, call this the 3 a.m. worry vortex because I would definitely wake up almost exactly at 3 a.m., between 3 and 3.20, almost every morning and start worrying about something that I had to do the next day that I hadn't prepared for or something that I had done the day before that I should have done differently or <laughs> whatever it was. And it was always really, really difficult to get back to sleep. So a couple of things I found helpful in that regard is the meditation, because we do have this worry vortex because we are thinking about the future or the past. Like in the current situation, when you're lying in bed, you're not in danger. There's nothing to be worried about now. Fear doesn't come into what's happening right now. So meditating just makes you focus on your breath right now at this time and sort of tries to block out these other thoughts that can really consume us, particularly at three o'clock in the morning. So that, that's one thing that you can do. Another thing you can do I found really, really useful is I've only, I've only heard this once, but it absolutely rings true for me. I've tried to research, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, there's something called the sleep train. <laughs> and if you wake up in the middle of the night, the sleep train will leave the station and not come back for another 90 minutes. On average, it's another 90 minutes before the sleep train comes back in and you can fall asleep again. So if you're sitting there stressing about how little sleep you're getting, you know, if you just accept that you're probably going to be awake for another 90 minutes and make yourself a cup of herbal tea, read a book for a little while, you know, do things to, to sort of calm down your body, not stimulate anything, but just calm it down. So your body is ready to go back to sleep after 90 minutes instead of stressing about how little sleep you're getting. Um, and that, that definitely really helped me. <laughs> I know babies do it like that, but I wasn't aware that adults do it like that until I heard this presentation. So that could be an interesting tip for you. <laughs> Yeah, I know I, I said the last question, but let's do justice to Bumi. <laughs> so this is the last question for the day. And um, because I know uh, we have some other special announcement for, for the members of this association. So the question is coming from Bumi and it goes this way. How great is impact on switching off the light? We should start as it. As it. My mind. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the interference. Okay, so he's asking how what how 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 great is the impact of switching off light against not switch against having it on, you know, to get quality of sleep, considering that some people are nictophobia, that is afraid of light and have bad dreams in the dark. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm not I'm not a sleep doctor again. <laughs> I, I would say as long as it's not, you know, the, the, the lights of your mobile phones, like all of the blue lights and things, um, which can affect um, your serotonin levels and things like that. Um, you know, as long as you can sleep with it, with that kind of light on, then, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought that there would be a problem. But again, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a sleep doctor. <laughs> but um yeah, what, whatever works for you, you know, it's it's your success formula, as I said in the beginning. So, um, yeah, if, if that helps you get to sleep, why not? I would say, why not? Okay, thank you, Alison, for answering those questions. Everyone, thank you for joining this um, webinar and also for the great questions and yeah. comments.